Good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to this month's edition of the All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. I appreciate you all dialing in. During this webinar, you will be able to type questions and comments into the chat box. And we have several moderators from various extension systems that's going to help answer these questions as we go along. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer some of those questions that maybe weren't addressed during the presentation. And we'd all, we also have a few survey questions we would like for you to answer. Today's presenter is Mr. Brian Wilkins, Research Horticulturist for Auburn University's Department of Horticulture and Gulf Coast Research and Extension Center. He will be discussing managing pests and backyard pecans. Brian, thank you for uh, speaking with us today. Oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. Um, as Bethany said, uh, my name is Brian Wilkins. I am the Research Horticulturist down here in Fairhope at our Gulf Coast Research Station. And one of my main responsibilities is working with pecans. What I want to talk with you about today is growing pecans in your backyard. So, you know, title is Homeowner Pecan Growing 101. Now, just a little background. Pecans are native to North America. They're the only, they're indigenous only to North America. So, you know, even though pecans are grown in South America, uh, South Africa, all over the world, they originated here, so they're ours. Their native range is from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to Illinois. They run along the Mississippi River Valley. You have a lot of pecans grown in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, but by far the most pecans are still grown in the southeast in Georgia and Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi, you know, in the southeast region. We have a lot of different cultivars with pecans. That's one of the things that's so nice about having pecans in your backyard and all around you native. You never know what you're going to find. These The seedlings are what we call native. They can vary in range from, you know, it takes 90 or 100 of them to make a pound up to, you know, 50 or 60 to make a pound. And they've got various shapes and sizes, and they get ready at different times of the year. Um, I get a lot of questions every year from homeowners and from, you know, commercial growers. And some of the biggest challenges I get with my homeowner questions are for insects, diseases, cultivars, and fertilization questions. And that's going to be the main topic of what I want to talk with you all about today. And uh, the first one we're going to talk about is insects. Now, as a lot of, there's several insects that, affect pecans or bother pecans, or any how you want to say it. And this is just a, a list of some of the more predominant ones that we see. Uh, pecan phylloxera, yellow aphid, black pecan aphid, hickory shelf worm, pecan weevils, fall web worms, and stink bugs. And this list is not exhaustive. There are other insects that can, you know, affect pecans, bother pecans, whatever you want to Everybody wants to say it, but this is probably the main list of, of insects that you will see or possibly see affecting your pecans. Now, this little this little devil right here, we get about a million questions every year about June, July, and August. You know, what's wrong with my pecans? My leaves have not sown them. They look blistered, or the my stems are blistered. Well, this is this is pecan phylloxera. And you can see right here, this low, it's a gall. And it, it really looks like something stung the leaf or bit the leaf. And it's a raised gall. And the bump's very hard. Over here, you can see this is actually the nutlet of where the pecan, the phylloxera's on the nutlet. And this is a leaf that has been severely misshapen and damaged by the phylloxera. Now, you know, this first leaf I showed you over here, this leaf can still photosynthesize. It can still, you know, perform functions that are beneficial to the tree. When you get to this kind of damage over here, you're getting into, you know, damage that is detrimental to the tree. Now, just a little background about a pecan, what pecan phylloxera are. They are small, a small aphid-like insect that is microscopic. You cannot see it without a hand lens. So, you know, you're not going to ever be able to go out there and look on the limbs or look on the leaves and say, oh, there it is, because 
it's, it's just too small. They attack the foliage, the shoots, and the fruit of the pecans. You know, nothing on the tree is safe. In, the insect causes the malformed and weakened shoots, which will eventually die. They they just feed on them, and the galls just disrupt all the metabolic activities. And the way you can tell you got them is they form, like we saw in the previous slide, those galls or those raised bumps on the leaves, the stems, the succulent shoots. Sometimes the catkins and the nuts of new growth every year. Now, the life cycle of the phylloxera, so you'll understand where you get the insects coming from, they overwinter as eggs in protected places on the bark, like the crotch of the limbs or up under some of up under some of the bark on the tree. You know, some pecans have real scaly bark that looks like shingles, and they can get up under that bark or in the cracks. Every spring, about bud break, which down here in Fairhope, that's going to be usually about mid-March or so for us, mid to late March, uh, the eggs are going to hatch. And what they do is they'll hatch just a few days before or during our bud break. And they're gonna, those young are going to feed on this new growth that's coming out just in the, in the spring. And these young cause a gall. Well, they lay their eggs in these galls. So the galls are basically a protected structure or habitat for the philosopher to lay their eggs. Once those eggs are in the galls hatch, those offspring fly out and lay more eggs. Well, then those offspring, they're either a male or a female of this last, so that would be like the third generation. And they, they have one sole purpose, and that's for mating and reproduction. They don't eat. They don't do anything. But the male and the female mate once that happens, and that's usually late, you know, late summer. The, male, the female, she'll crawl off to a protected area, you know, in the bark somewhere, and she dies with the egg inside her body. And she, her body basically acts as protection for that egg to get it through the winter, and then the cycle starts all over. Now, I always get questions, you know, well, what can I do? Is there anything I can do? Unfortunately, for homeowners, there is very few controls available. In a commercial setting, what we would do is we would spray, um, you know, a, a chemical at bud break. However, homeowners just don't have that luxury. Uh, some of the things you can do, um, you can get dead limbs out of the trees if they're hanging where you can safely reach them. Cleaning up dead limbs on the ground, cleaning up any of the debris that they might could overwinter in. If you can reach uh, some of the spots, one of the chemicals that we use has a metacloprid in it. And it is a safe chemical that is registered for homeowners. And um, one of them is Admire Pro. It's cheap. But, you know, again, it's virtually impossible without a large air blast sprayer. If you had a very small tree that you could reach the top of, you could take a, you know, a small pump-up sprayer and spray with. However, you know, if you do spray anything, always follow your label directions very carefully and, you know, do not deviate from the label. Now, the next in next insect I want to talk about is yellow pecan aphid. And this one, everybody sees these all year long. And you don't even, a lot of people don't even know they have them. If you've ever parked a vehicle up under a pecan tree in, in Alabama in the summer, all usually around July or August, you're going to come back out and no notice that you've got a bunch of black goo on your car. That's honeydew from aphids. And these little critters right here are what's causing it. These are black, these are yellow pecan aphids. And there are two types of yellow pecan aphids. You look over on the right side. This is a yellow aphid here. This is a black margin yellow aphid. As you can see, it has wings with a black margin on the tip, thus the name black margin aphid. And both of these are types of yellow that that we have a problem with in the, in the spring and summer. Now, usually well, there will be two flights of these 
pages, one in the early spring, and then usually July, August. Now, what they are, they are a small yellow-tinted insect, and they feed on the underside of the leaves. You're never going to see them on the top side. They feed by sucking on the, from the leaf veins, and what they do, they'll excrete you know, large amounts of honeydew, which is the black stuff that you see on your vehicle, or you'll see the leaves turn black. Now, the damage from these yellow aphids is they'll damage the vascular system of the leaves, which prevents photosynthesis or hinders photosynthesis. And the honeydew also hinders photosynthesis. It also causes a loss in chlorophyll development, and it'll, it'll actually hurt the size of the leaves because you have smaller leaves. The honeydew also is a media for downy mildew, which is a, will actually turn the leaves white. The good thing with yellow aphids is you can control them and very easily. Um, the biggest way to control them is leave them alone. And when we get this spring slide, it, I've never felt people that are, you know, really into their pecans out there observing them. They'll call me, like, I've got yellow bugs on the inside of my leaves. And if it's in the spring, you know, we tell them just ignore them because this first flight is never a very large population. And they'll crash very quickly. Natural predators uh, are another way that we use to control these uh, insects. And lastly, we use insecticides if, you know, they just get way out of control and, 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 and just unmanageable. Now, the beneficial insects I was referring to, here's two of them that everybody's seen. You've got lace wings on the left. Uh, picture A is an adult lace wing. It's just, it looks like a small green fly uh, that gets its name. So if you'll, you can see that its wings are very clear and delicate looking, and that's where it gets its name, lace wing, or that's my understanding. The bottom two on the left side are lace wing larvae. As you see in the very bottom picture, it, that larva actually has a, it's got one aphid up eating it, and there are some skeletalized aphids down low up that it's already munched off. Now on the left side is an insect everybody's familiar with, lady beetle. They can eat thousands of, in, thousands of aphids a day. And the larva, which is the bottom picture, looks nothing like a lady beetle, it's like a small weird looking worm kind of, but they can eat. You can see on the picture right here that this is this little insect's alive. Right here. That one's alive. This one's dead where it's been eaten. This one's been eaten. So you see the cast and the skeletons all around where those ladybugs have already been eating on them. Now, black pecan aphid is another aphid that we deal with, and this one is much more destructive than the yellow pecan aphid is. Uh, as I said earlier, a lot of times we just we completely ignore the yellow aphid and unless it just gets completely out of control. The black aphid, on the other hand, we don't we do not ignore it because it doesn't take but just a few of these to completely defoliate the tree. Now, what the black pecan aphid is, is a small black-winged aphid. This picture here on the right is a picture I took last year with my micro, under my microscope. That, and that's why it's, uh, it's not the best quality, but what you can see right there is a bunch, is a small insect with little black dots, kind of olive green in color. That is the nymph of the black aphid, and they do as much feeding as the adults do. They're light green to olive in color. And if you can find the eggs, which you need a you need a hand lens to do it, they are shiny and black. The black aphids, I should have mentioned this while ago, the yellow aphids are you don't need a hand lens to see them. You know, they're they're right there, you can see them just fine without a hand lens. Black aphids, if you know what you're looking for, you can see them without the hand lens. A hand lens is better just to kind of, in which a hand lens is just a small magnifying glass. Uh, 
to help you identify them. <laughs> the black um, the black pecan aphids overwinters eggs, and if bud break, they'll hatch, and the nymphs will feed on unfurling leaves. You got a winged stem mother that comes out that bears young, and then they will after that first cycle, these winged stem mothers start, you know, hatching eggs, and in the summer, the life cycle varies. You know, you can have a cycle as short as five days depending on the weather, up to, you know, be 15 days or so. And in the summer, when we get, you know, just optimal growing conditions, you can have as many as 26 to 30 generations in a season. And we usually see our largest populations in August and September. The reason we see them in August and September is if you've got real dry, dusty conditions, that is ideal for black pecan aphid development. They love dry and dust. You know, during June and July when we're getting a lot of rain, the rain will actually kind of help keep them down, that, all that moisture. You know, they just don't, they're not as active. They don't like it as well. So, you know, you're going to see your largest populations in August and September. The first sign of feeding, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of this in a minute, is you'll see just a single bright, yellow dot somewhere on that leaf and that dot will just slowly expand and you can get, if you get three or four dead spots on a leaflet they can cause a uh, leaf death and black pecan aphids if you get, a, get an infestation that's bad enough they can defoliate a tree in a week or less. I've got some trees here on the station that are uh, 35, 40 years old they're probably 60 feet tall, and they're out away from the farm. They're, um, they're not in a test, so they don't get sprayed as often. And they got black aphids on them a year or two ago. And those trees being 60 feet tall with probably a 60 feet uh, limb spread were completely defoliated in about a week. So, they, I mean, these things can eat them up quick. Now, one thing that is kind of unique to the black pecan aphid versus the yellow aphid is if they develop on a, a certain variety, that's where they like to stay. For instance, if um, you got a, st if a steward or a forkard in your yard and you got and they develop on that forkard, they're not very, they might do it and they can, but they're not likely to transfer over. And there are varieties that are more susceptible than others of Oconee. Sumner, Forkert, Caddo, and Elliot, just to name a few, are very susceptible. And we have all of those varieties here on the station. And what I do every year in, in July and August when I'm looking for these insects to determine whether we need to take action on them is I go to these trees first. And if I find them on these trees, then I know they're here and I know that we need to be looking on our other trees but there are trees that seem to be real resistant or, you know, that just tolerant of them. Gafford, Amling, McMillan, Syrup Mill um, are just a few that they don't seem to bother Kansas. They don't seem to bother it. So, you know, even though you've got susceptible varieties, you also have varieties that they don't seem to bother and it just doesn't, they don't even pay them any attention, really. Now, this is what black pecan aphid damage looks like. If you see this picture right here in the center, I took this picture on September the 13th last year. And this tree is, if you look at kind of in the back of this, right here, this tree is not hurt. But this tree up here is, it, it's almost completely defoliated. Right here, you can see what the damage looks like. That, that black brown spot right there. What you're going to see with black pecan aphids is that spot is going to start somewhere right here about the mid vein of the leaflet. It's never going to start out here on the edge. It'll always be in the in here in the middle. If you have some a leaf that starts browning out here on the edge and that browning extends, spreads inward toward the mid vein, that's bacterial leaf storage. But if, if the spot starts here toward the mid vein and, work, and radiates out and encompasses the leaf, then you've got 
probably black pecan aphids. And you can see how that little bitty spot starts, and then it just kind of gets brown. And as it stands out, it gets yellow, a yellow halo around it. So down at the bottom, right there, bottom left, that's, you can see the damage done by black pecan aphids. That is completely defoliated this tree, and all you've got left is the nut. This is going to hinder, number one, it's going to hinder your nut development. Number two, if you defoliate that tree, if that tree defoliates early, it's going to very well hinder you from having a return crop next year. The earlier the leaves drop off, the less likely it is that you will have a return crop or you'll have a very reduced crop the next year. There is not a lot that homeowners can do to control black pecan aphids. If you do get it, one about the only control that I know for a homeowner is um, you do a soil drench with one of the imidacloprid products again, of uh, Admire Pro, Wrangler, some of those. There are label directions, and just follow the directions, and what it'll do is imidacloprid will be absorbed by the tree and sucked up through the roots and transmitted to the leaves. It's not 100% effective, but it, it can help you. It'll probably take, depending on how much rain we get and how active the trees are, if we're not in a drought situation, they'll probably, you know, you'll probably get some benefit in three to four days if you're in a drought situation. You'll need to water it in and um, hopefully get it'll get up to the leaves. If, the drought, if you're in a drought situation, it's going to be real hard for it to take the, the uh, chemical up. <laughs> Excuse me. Another problem, another insect that we see every year, and you see this in August, September, is uh, webworms. And everybody will, you know, you'll call out, what's going on? Well, you got webworms. And they'll, uh, they will defoliate a tree. And that's, that's their main damage. And they um, lay eggs in late May to June or late July to August. They're going to lay two to six hundred, you know, two to six hundred eggs at a time. And the eggs hatch, and it's the larvae or the worms that are feeding on the leaves. Now, these are real simple to control. This is just a mass of, of, of eggs that have, well, a mass of larvae that have hatched. And you can see how they're just continually munching on that leaf, eat, that leaf that eating it up. And they're going to eventually eat that entire compound leaf. And they get their name on the web that they spin for the uh, eggs to hatch into. They are, you can control them by cutting the branches out and, and get, destroying the branches, um, crushing the insects. Uh, do not take a kerosene. Uh, one of the old wise tales is take a kerosene rag, put it on a stick, and burn them out of the tree. I don't recommend doing that. That's dangerous. You can cause a lot of damage. But if you can safely reach up with a with a pair of loppers or a pruning saw and cut the limb out and you know put it in the trash, destroy it, whatever, that'll be the easiest way to control these fall webworms. Another insect that you're going to see, you won't see, but you'll see as damage, is the hickory shuck worm. And the adult, uh, the top picture right here is the is the adult. It's a small gray moth. They're only active at night. They're very hard to trap, very hard to find. You, the eggs are a small, white, and flattened. You usually hardly ever see them. This is the larva, an immature larva. They're a caterpillar. And upon hatching, the larva begin tunneling into the nut. That's where the damage comes from, mostly. They overwinter in old shucks on the ground and in the trees where the pupation occurs. <coughs> Excuse me. Adults emerge and lay eggs on the foliage and the flocks for galls and on hickory trees. And this is one of the other problems that I'm, I meant to add about phylloxera for is they are they will host other insects like the hickory shuck worm. And when the adults emerge, they'll lay their eggs on these galls. Now, eggs on if the eggs are laid on the foliage from these early this adult emergence, that those eggs will die before they reach maturity and you won't ever have a problem with them. 
but the ones that are laid on phylloxera galls are able to complete their life cycle. And um, that just, and then you have another set of eggs that are laid late in the summer. So you get about two, and those eggs are laid on the nuts, which are the ones that actually cause the damage. So if you have, you know, if you have a tree that's free from a phylloxera, that's going to help, you know, if you help you not have hickory shuckworm. Now, this is some of the damage that they cause. If you look right here on this nut, you can see this black area right here. This is where that, that larva has tunneled in through the shuck and started feeding on the inside or the underside of the shuck, and it causes this black, this is that black grass. Now, what that's going, they're going to do is, uh, if it's the four shell hardening, they're going to, it's going to cause the, the, the nuts to drop prematurely. It's going to cause poor kernel development. And uh, you'll get stick tights. Now, stick tights, I'm sure you've seen them, are when the nuts are sitting there on the tree and the shucks won't open and they just stay green and they'll just eventually drop or they'll just keep hanging on the tree and turn black. But the shucks won't open. That's called stick tights. They can also, shuckworm damage also causes scarring and discoloration of the shell. And if it doesn't cause a stick tight, it can delay the nuts in the opening extremely late. Now, there are some things that you can do to control the shuckworm. One is sanitation. In the, after you get through harvesting your nuts, and most homeowners do this anyway, you clean up your leaves, make sure you get the nuts up. You know, rake them up whatever, throw them away. If you're burning your leaves, throw them on the pile. But, you know, get them out of the yard, get them away from your tree, and you're going to get rid of a lot of your overwintering silkworms that way. Encourage your neighbors to do the same. That way you don't get their problem. They know you're cleaning yours up. You know, if your neighbor leaves his nuts, his shucks on the ground or old leaves on the ground, you're going, you can still get the problem. So, you know, encourage your neighbors. If feasible, and this is not usually a feasible option, if you've got the hickory trees around, get rid of the hickory trees because they are hosts for the shuckworm. Another thing you can do is just plant as far away from the woods as possible. If you've got a, a wooded area of forest you know, near your house and you're wanting to plant pecan trees, go to the other side of the property if you've got some open away from the woods, and that'll help you. Another insect that will give you problems as a homeowner is a pecan weevil. It's a light grayish brown beetle seen here on the left with long beak. Uh, the immature larvae are white. They're very similar to the shuckworm. And then the mature larvae are the fat ones right here on the right. They're like a, a grub you would fish with with a red, reddish brown head, real fat. They emerge in July and September. And the females will drill holes through the shucks and the shells, and they're going to place two to four eggs in the kernel. And then those eggs are going to hatch and, and, about, and feed for 30 days. Uh, this is done, when this is done, um, it's done right there around shell hardening just a, a little bit before. The larvae will leave the nuts sometime between September and December, and where they're going to go into the soil. They're going to remain in the soil for one to two years before becoming adults and then re-emerging and laying eggs and starting over. So these are a very um, hard weevil. They're hard to control. Their, their life cycle takes three years to complete. So, you know, you're getting a, it's a continual thing with them. Now, some of the damage, and most all of us have seen this damage before. In the top right here, you've got the holes where the larva have fed in, and then it, here at the bottom you can see where they were actually inside the kernel and have fed around. They're going to cause premature nut drop. They'll, as you see in the bottom uh, left-hand picture, they'll destroy the nut interior. The infested nuts are recognized by the circular emergence holes where the grubs escape. And then, you know, if you've got a large enough infestation of these on weevils, they will destroy your entire crop. Unfortunately, unlike hickory shuckworm, where you can just clean up, there are no insecticide sprays or anything that you can do to really, unfortunately, you know, the insecticide sprays are the only control 
we use a little bit of foliage spray in the fall of about August, September. One thing a homeowner can do is about the time of emergence, you can put, you can get seven, which um, you can get at your uh, local feed store or, uh, you know, supply store, and you want to put it on about as a trunk spray about the time of emergence. I would only spray trees where I've had weevil damage before. Spraying other trees is just wasting your money. And what you'll do is you just walk, spray up as high as you can reach with your wand and spray from there to the ground all, all the way around the trunk of the tree. You know, make sure you follow all label rates and directions. Another insect that we uh, will see a lot in the fall is a stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs. These are very present. Everybody knows them. You know, if you mash these things, they always smell horrible. This is a brown stink bug. This is a southern green stink bug. This is a leaf-footed bug, and it gets its name that its foot actually looks like a leaf. This is some of the damage they, they cause. They will sting the nut. They can sting it either before shell hardening or they can sting it after. And this will cause a bitter spot and it reduces your shell quality, makes the nut taste terrible. They can cause a premature nut drop. And then, you know, after, like I said, after shell hardening, they, um, they'll put black spots on the kernel that make the kernel bitter. You can control them by, uh, you know, don't plant host crops like soybeans or cotton or corn nearby. You can plant trap crops to, you know, kind of pull them out of your pecan uh, and use it like sunflower, millet, and sorghum. They love sunflowers. And if you plant sunflowers kind of not really under your pecans, but close to your pecans, but far enough away that the bugs will actually go from your pecans to your sunflowers, that will help you, and you can go in there and pick them off and mash them or whatever. Another thing you can do is clean up any leaf litter and grass piles because they like they, you know, that harbors them. Now, I, you know, I told you you have to, insects, diseases, cultivars, and fertilization were the main questions I get. And one thing I want to go with you is, um, especially for homeowners, is some cultivar recommendations for low input and home planting. The num one thing I want to stress to you, num the number one pest of pecans is not an insect. It is a, a disease called scab, and it is the major limiting factor in pecan production of east of the Mississippi River. As you can see right here, this, this leaf is healthy. This is a Jenkins. It was sprayed eight times. This is a Kiowa. Kiowa is very susceptible. Scab is a fungal disease that will turn your leaves black. You can see the little black spots and, and where this even looks brown and burnt here. It will also cause your nuts to turn black. This will in turn, the nuts will never develop properly or they will half develop and you won't get a crop. So one of the ways that we try to combat scab other than spraying is to develop cultivars that are resistant or at least, you know, tolerant to scab. And we have gone through over the years, and there has been years and years of research done. I have, I have a...
Hey, Bethany, I'm back. You got me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, sorry about that. My phone went stupid. Um, back to what I was saying. I'm sorry about that, y'all. Um, we, um, one, I have a study here at the station where we've got about 90, 75 to 100 different varieties where we're screening for scab. And we will go through and we'll rate them every year as to, uh, you know, as to just how bad they are, they are affected by it. And what we've found over the years is we have found varieties that are, you know, tolerant. So what I'm going to go over with you is just a few of these varieties that you can get for your home if you're wanting to buy um, pecans. Now, what the scab level resistance recommend, uh, excellent recommendation for re resistance is Excel. That is, we, and then we've got some recommended traditionally for trial, Kansas, Gafford, and headquarters, and then home plantings only, Amling, Adams 5, Prillip, and Miss L. Now, these nuts over the years have done the best at um, not having scab. Excel is a rather large nut. As you can see here, it's, um, 40, it's come out of Georgia. It's 45 nuts to the pound, and it'll yield about 49% kernel. And what that means is once you, if you weigh those nuts, a pound of nuts in shell, and then crack them, you're going to have 49% of the weight they meet. The XL has, X, I've watched it several years down here. It's got excellent scab resistance. I have it in a block that are completely eat up with scab every year, and the trees have never gotten it. They have real pretty bright kernels. They get ready um, early to mid-October. Well, you know, like I said, we've had excellent scab resistance. I've had good yields every year. We're, we're, we're looking at uh, all they, they, they have a handy crop, so we're a little bit concerned they might have alternate bearing. Another one that I really like is Kansas. Now, this is a nut uh, that we are starting to recommend more for North Alabama. It's very similar to Elliott. Uh, Elliott is one of the old standard nuts that was scab resistant. Uh, it's been around since the 1930s, come out of Florida. And it's a very small nut. It's usually the nuts you see on candies. It's a very a teardrop-shaped nut. Kansas came out of the uh, University of Kansas breeding program. It's um, about the same size as Elliot. A lot of times you can put it right next to an Elliot, and the only way you can tell the difference is Kansas doesn't have the same striping. Uh, 65 nuts a pound is yielding 52% kernel. Very bright color, um, excellent scab resistance here. Um, it, we like it for North Alabama because it doesn't bloom out as early as Elliot does and it doesn't seem to get frosted out in years that Elliot can get, get frozen out and not have a crop. It uh, gets ready. We start shaking Kansas here about uh, September, somewhere between the 25th of September and the 1st of October. So it's a very small nut, very nice nut, got good quality. We really like it. We think it's going to do good. Another nut that we're high on is Gafford. It's a medium-sized nut. I've got it here at the station uh, in my unsprayed test. No scab problems. Real bright kernel. About 50%, you know, about 50% kernel. 55, 56, 60 nuts to the pound. This tree, I have not noticed anything about it. No insects, no disease. It's really clean. They do tend to, as the slide says, they do tend to alternate bear. You'll have a good crop one year and then a real light crop the next year. So that could be a problem, but they are a pretty shade tree, you know, if you want one for your yard. Headquarters is another uh, small nut. It looks like an alias, probably an alias seedling. It came out of our uh, research program at E.V. Smith in Tallahassee. They're about the same size as an alias, about 60 nuts to the pound. They have good scab resistance, um, got great flavor, great oil. They're a lo little bit larger than an Elliot. They're also not as thick-shelled as an Elliot, so they're um, a little easier to shell. 
They got good scab resistance, and they will yield higher than Elliot, and they're not. These have not seen dogs from the bear as bad as Elliot. I, I really like this nut. Um, it's a good nut. This is the prize for the homeowners, Amling. It's a Texas seedling. It's a small nut. Um, 60 nuts to the pound is being generous. It probably takes a little more than that. Real high yield, about 53% kernel. It's very bright, real pretty. They don't overbear. We never have an alternate bearing problem. Um, this tree has never had a problem. This is one of the prettiest trees we have on the place every year. It never gets sprayed. It has no scab, no bugs. This tree is just an excellent tree for your yard to make a pretty shade tree and to give you nuts. Phillip is a little old nut that comes out of Texas, about 84 nuts a pound. It's small, but it's probably one of the best tasting ones you would ever eat. And it has, um, it's got excellent scab resistance, very, I don't know that I've ever seen scab on it. McMillan's another one of our nuts that we like. It's a mid to late harvester. We can get ready uh, in November. They're very consistent, no offset bearing problems. About 60 nuts to the pound, uh, around 50% kernel. The color's not real pretty. It's just if you don't get them up right away, they will darken up and, and the kernels will not be pretty at all. Now, what I wanted to show you here is this is my unsprayed block. This tree right here, that you can see in the front, that's a desirable. That's the tree that has grown the most in Georgia. That's the one everybody wants. It's a great big nut. You cannot grow desirable without spraying it. This tree here is a prillip. This tree back here, you can just barely see the top of the McMillan. Directly behind the desirable is a gaffer, this full tree that's actually making the desirable look like it has a leaf. And then this is Adams 5, another one with a small nut out of Georgia that we're looking at. As you can see, these would be good homeowner trees because even though this desirable has scab and is completely, almost completely defoliated, these trees are not. And wrapping up, one thing I want to wrap up with waste improved production at your house. We get questions every year about fertilization. And the biggest thing, easiest thing I can tell you is this little rule right here. For every eight, put a pound of triple 13 for every year of age of your tree up to 25 years old. After that, put a half, put a 25 pound bag or half of a 50 pound bag per tree, or if you're trying to do a whole acre, do 300 pounds to the acre. You're gonna spread it out there under the drip line of the tree. Do not throw it right up next to the trunk. Most of your um, cedar roots are out at the drip line. Uh, you can put a little, put a, a pound of ammonium nitrate up to 20 pounds to the tree, put a zinc sulfate up to two pounds per tree, and then lime. And don't put all your fertilizer on at one time. We do a split application. We'll put, we put, them, put our fertilizer on in April to May after the leaves come out. We'll put half on then, and then we'll put half on in uh, June to July. And we just we broadcast it under the surface of the tree. And if you've got a real large crop one year, you might want to do a little bit more in of August. <clears throat> Another way that you can improve your production is, you know, as we, I said earlier, huge pest-resistant cultivars like Gafford and McMillan headquarters. You know, look for something that is going to keep you from having to spray or have a lot of insect problems. You know, make sure your trees have enough room for good sunlight. If you've got several trees close together and the limbs are overlapping, you can cut those limbs out, and they will... Um, and once that gets sunlight in there, that's actually going to help in bud development and nut development down the road. And another thing that really helps is uh, water. In late August and July, when the trees are, um, when the nuts are filling, that is the most critical time for water. Pecan trees need about an acre inch of water a week, to, um, or about one and a half to two inches a week. And from August to September, so you know, water your trees once or twice a week. You know, water them real deep, 
let it, you know, get a good deep watering, and that's going to help with your tree health and also with your nut size. Some people like to maintain a layer of organic mulch, mulch like marks or leaf compost litter, you know, to help preserve root moisture and to pres and help grow. I'm not crazy about it. It sets up a place for um, harboring insects, and also it makes it a real headache to harvest nuts that fall up under the tree. Um, that's going to conclude my my presentation. Of I'll, if you got any questions, I'll help. Any questions for Brian that weren't typed in the chat box? Brian, I think there were several folks that were wondering about um, a cultivars list, and Doug has um, offered to get that for them if they'll email him or either uh, if you maybe we could provide that if they email you. So we've listed both of your email addresses in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, another place they could look, Bethany, is uh, go to alabamapecangrowers.com. And we have a, on the website is a list of nurseries where um, they can pick up some of these trees. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, well, once again, Brian, thank you um, for uh, presenting today. Um, we've got a couple things that we'd like for you to do. Suzanne, if you would put up the um, four poll questions, please. And then, Taylor, if you wouldn't mind posting the um, survey link in the chat box, <laughs> please, um, if you don't mind, all attendees, if you'll complete that survey link, we would really appreciate your feedback on this seminar. Any other questions while, we're, um, while others are completing those poll questions, we'd be happy to entertain. We'll take a few more minutes to complete the poll questions. Okay, well, Brian, once again, thank you so much for sharing um, all this useful information with us today. I know. Uh, as an extension agent, we get a lot of calls about pecans, and, and it's a challenge with homeowners. So we're thankful for the information that you sent us today and um, gives us a lot of good um, knowledge that we can share with others. So thank you. And thank you for all those who helped moderate today as well as all those who tuned in. So we appreciate it. Um, and remember, next month we'll be having our Spotted Wing Drosophila uh, webinar uh, the first Friday of in June. So be sure to tune in on that one. Thank you.